Uh, my name is Peter Young. I am the CEO and president of Young and Partners, and uh, we're very, very pleased to be uh, your host for today's 16th annual Pharmaceutical Executive Summit uh, that's really focused on emerging strategic and financial industries in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries. Uh, this has been a wonderful tradition, and uh, we're very, very pleased that we have been able to do this uh, for these many years. Uh, before I start, I, mo many of you know about our firm, but I thought I would uh, just, uh, for those of you who may not know us, just briefly tell you a little about the history of the firm and what we do. Uh, Young Partners is completing its 25th year since it was founded uh, in 1996. Uh, it was founded by a number of senior people who were running uh, industry groups in the areas we focus uh, at major firms like Lehman Brothers, et, and, et, et cetera. Uh, we really focus just on two industries. Uh, one is life sciences, which includes pharma, biotech, medical devices, et cetera, and also the chemical industry and everything in between. So we cover APIs, uh, life science tools, et cetera, because uh, after all, uh, the chemical and life science industries uh, have been attached to each other for, for many years. Uh, in terms of uh, today's event, uh, I'm very excited about uh, the topics and the speakers, uh, starting with our keynote speaker, speaker Peter Marks, who, uh, as many of you know, uh, is uh, the head of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and many things uh, fall under his, uh, his leadership, uh, but two that are very important to this audience. One is he, everything related to vaccines reports to him. So all the work that is being done for COVID-19 vaccines uh, goes through his group. But he also has responsibility for gene therapy, which we all know is a very exciting, but also complex uh, area uh, of, uh, you know, of, of, of biotech and pharma and has tremendous pro promise, but also some uh, obstacles and hurdles that, uh, that have to be overcome. So he's going to be our keynote speaker. Uh, he's going to talk about some of the developments in his two areas, but then there's gonna be a fireside chat where the moderator is Dr. Steven Spielberg, who is a senior member of our firm. Uh, and uh, he is going to uh, uh, go through Two sets of questions related to the impact the pandemic has had on the FDA and its operations, but also the impact that the pandemic has had on the industry uh, as a whole. The last thing uh, I want to say is that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, Young and Partners is distinctive in a number of ways. Uh, one is that we're only mostly senior people. So 80% of the firm are very senior people. Uh, second, uh, the senior people not only uh, get projects, but they have to manage them. And uh, so uh, we don't have junior people running projects. I think the other thing that's distinctive about the firm, other than the fact that we do most of the traditional investment banking uh, 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 services, whether it's capital raising or m and uh, but we also are somewhat unique in that we're able to do, uh, uh, combine corporate strategy and a financial strategy or investment banking strategy. Uh, I think we've found with a lot of our clients that there are many, many problems or opportunities which are not just business strategy or investment bank, but it's combined. That to get to the right answer requires a combination of those skills. Uh, and as one of my clients said, McKinsey doesn't know investment banking and Goldman Sachs doesn't know business strategy. So the combination, which we're somewhat, we're really uniquely uh, have those unique capabilities because many of us have had very serious uh, corporate strategy and, and operational strategy experience is that we can deal with certain kinds of problems much more effectively. Welcome, Peter, to, uh, to this event. Uh, I um, uh, want to just briefly uh, introduce uh, uh, Peter. Uh, Peter is really a, an exceptional person in the biopharma world. Uh, I just saw an article that said, what are the you know, 20 top people who have an impact uh, on the biopharma? And he was on the list, which didn't surprise me. 
But as I said before at the beginning, uh, he has a very important job at the FDA in that uh, as a head of a CBER, all vaccines and gene therapy uh, report to him. I won't go through his entire bio because all of you who are attending got the invitation, but I really wanna welcome Peter uh, as our keynote speaker. Uh, and uh, he's gonna talk about you know, both areas, the vaccine and the gene therapy, both of which are critical, critical issues for the industry, but also for the well-being of, of humanity as well. So with that, Peter, I'd like to uh, do one thing, which is I'm going to, there we go. Okay, good. Go ahead, Peter. Great, Thank, thanks very much. Thanks very much for having me today. So um, what I'll do is uh, tell you a little bit about some perspectives on the development of vaccines and gene therapies. Spend roughly about 10 or 15 minutes on, on, on each, um, uh, uh, maybe a little less um, on vaccines. Uh, and and uh, so I'm gonna tell you about vaccines and which are very practical right now for COVID-19 vaccines. So we'll use that as an example. And then we'll talk about gene therapies uh, because uh, of the fact that they are really the, the future in some ways that got interrupted um, uh, by uh, COVID-19 at this point. So um, at, at FDA, uh, we have a very broad role um, in vaccine development. Uh, and, and that includes uh, the fact that we have laboratories that are, are often involved in things like strain selection and reference standard production. Um, uh, we in the United States do lot release where uh, a, a certain proportion of the vaccine that is released uh, is tested. Uh, and if it's not tested, uh, uh, it, some of it goes through protocol or lot release. Um, uh, we uh, are responsible obviously for the evaluation of safety and efficacy of vaccines, but we also um, are involved in the post-market surveillance of uh, vaccines. Uh, so after they're on the market, we look for adverse events that might creep up. Uh, and uh, other things we have come to do um, over the course of time have been working to advance vaccine technology because it's clear that our old batch manufacturing technologies for vaccines um, are not keeping pace with the times and our needs to scale up uh, when we have emergencies like a pandemic. Um, and, and all of this hopefully um, is important in helping to ensure public confidence because at the end of the day with vaccines, if we don't have people willing to take them, um, they are really uh, useless. And I, I just start here by showing you, um, uh, this is from uh, Peter Hortez and, and uh, Dr. Marsh from uh, uh, the New York Times uh, uh, earlier this year, um, just showing the importance of public confidence in vaccines. Um, the, the, the point here really is on the right, you see, th this is for measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. You see the, the risk from the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine in terms of adverse events is pretty small. You notice there's not a black dot there. That means that there are no deaths. Um, you're talking about uh, a, 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 a few uh, fever-related seizures that can occur. Um, uh, and on the left, you see uh, what happens when people get the measles. Um, and uh, the uh, 10 to 30 child deaths in that black box there that you see towards the middle in the red and all that red, that's what you see in high income countries. Uh, the uh, black box that you see towards the, uh, the bottom right of the square, uh, that's what you see in uh, low and middle income countries in terms of deaths with measles, uh, 146 per 10,000. So measles is not such a benign disease. It's something that we should want to prevent. Um, and the risks of doing so with vaccines are pretty small um, and the only way you get to preventing measles is if it, it, the way we need to is if people have confidence enough to take the vaccine. And so um, it's really critical that we maintain that confidence in vaccines. I just show you the same thing for influenza. On the right shows you that, yep, there is probably a slight increase in risk 
of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is something that actually happens associated rarely with influenza itself. Um, uh, but on an average year, it, that, that risk um, could go up by a very, uh, a, a, a very small amount um, uh, compared to the number of influenza hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and obviously you can kind of, since COVID-19 has a death rate that is uh, 10 to 15 times higher than seasonal influenza, you can see, you can, you can just imagine the size of the black box here. Um, if we have a safe and effective uh, COVID-19 vaccine, what we might be able to prevent. So we have to make sure what we do, ha we have people have confidence in us for doing that. So for, for the vaccines in development right now, uh, most of these vaccines are uh, for COVID-19 uh, or SARS coronavirus 2, which is the virus itself that causes uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, it, they're, they're mostly targeting the spike protein, this S protein that you've read about in the New York Times and other medical journals. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the other protein that, that one can make a vaccine against is the nuclear protein, the N protein. And so there are some proteins uh, that are amenable to targeting uh, S and N or two, most of the vaccines are just looking at S. A few vaccines are going for S and N. And obviously there are some uh, that are looking at the whole virus particle. So the vaccine approaches that people are using their DNA uh, vaccine approaches, RNA approaches, protein subunit approaches, uh, whole inactivated virus. That's an old fashioned way of making uh, vaccine. That's the, the original Salk polio vaccine was just an inactivated virus vaccine and they can be given alone or with an adjuvant. An adjuvant is something that helps stimulate the immune system uh, and is sometimes given uh, with a uh, killed virus vaccine. Um, Non-replicating viral vectors. Um, we have uh, two in phase three trials here in the United States already. Um, the uh, Janssen uh, 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 chimp adenovirus and the, uh, I'm sorry, the I, I got it backwards, the AstraZeneca chimp adenovirus and the Janssen um, uh, ADN26 vector. Um, uh, and uh, 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 replicating viral vectors and virus-like particles. So when we think at FDA, what we're thinking about, what's important here is obviously we have to have a very high quality vaccine. And so manufacturing quality is a really important thing. Um, we're also going to be concerned about safety and efficacy. And in this setting, uh, we'll be looking at post-market surveillance or post-deployment surveillance because these vaccines will make it to deployment faster uh, than average uh, for these products. What we did at the outset of this um, was started to think about what uh, manufacturers were going to need. And uh, in June, uh, we put out a guidance on the development of licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19. And then as we started to get through the summer, it became clearer uh, that the first wave of vaccines might uh, be applicable for, uh, or might, might be eligible for emergency use uh, authorization. And so we uh, put out a guidance in, uh, or which was finally published in early October um, on uh, our criteria for emergency use authorization for vaccines. Um, what, we, what we were trying to articulate in these guidance is what we needed to see um, uh, from these uh, vaccines to be able to feel confident that they were gonna address the needs of the country for a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine. So we talked about in, uh, in, the, in the first guidance, we talked about the need that the clinical trials were gonna to have to enroll diverse populations um, uh, in, including people across the age, spect age spectrum and uh, including ethnic minorities. Um, that was a really an important piece here because it's the older individuals who are, and minorities who are being disproportionately affected. Um, we also realized that you have to study other populations like women who could become pregnant or pregnant women and Ultimately, if we want to stop the spread of this, we're going to have to make sure that the vaccine works in pediatrics as well. We did something a little bit unusual for um, FDA, which is normally we don't in our guidance say how effective a vaccine needs to be uh, in order for us to consider licensing it or uh, authorizing it. Uh, in this case, we decided that because of the opportunity cost 
of vaccinating people in the middle of a pandemic, we probably should have some target. And we picked a target, which uh, is probably a modest one, uh, but it's, it's one that we felt we should be able to achieve because seasonal influenza on a good year, the influenza vaccine prevents about 50% of uh, influenza related illness. Um, uh, we felt that something around 50% should be kind of over better than a placebo was a reasonable um, uh, endpoint uh, to target. And not to get to uh, 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 statistical ease about this, uh, but we put a lower uh, limit on, on uh, the 95% confidence interval of, of at least 30%. What that does is it, it, it basically makes the trial large enough that one can have confidence uh, that there's a low chance that you're gonna actually say something is effective when it's not. Um, uh, and um, uh, we, we said that you could do interim analyses on these trials so that we could try to get there a little bit faster um, given the nature of this pandemic. We also talked about the fact that there needed to be a robust safety uh, uh, evaluation um, and that ultimately there should be reasonably long follow-up of, of individuals. That doesn't mean that we have to wait for the follow-up to be over in order to issue an emergency use authorization. It means that we want people uh, who are enrolled in the trials ultimately to be followed uh, over the course of a year or so. So we understand not just what the safety profile is, but also what happens to the immune response because we know that in natural infections, sometimes when people don't have a very symptomatic infection, their antibody titers can wane and they can get reinfected rarely. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that's what we know to date. And we're gonna have to just watch that. Uh, so we, we have to we wanna, wanna make sure we keep tabs of this in, in studies. And, and we also talked about the fact that we're gonna be needing to really have a very robust methods for using large databases. What we, we, we do is actually we use claims databases. Uh, uh, so uh, claims databases are a wonderful way to get at very large populations. You look for events um, of interest. Um, we are using claims databases and claims databases that are tied to the electronic health record so that if we see an event, we can then get down into the granularity of what actually happened uh, by being able to inquire into the medical record. These are distributed databases. So when FDA gets the data, we don't know who it's from. We just know the data. Um, and, and that's for that, that's a, a model that was developed uh, over a decade ago for the Sentinel system. And it, it works pretty well. Uh, we talked about whether you could, uh, in this guidance is that we have, we've been talking about whether you could speed things along uh, because many times you with vaccine development, you have an immune correlate, either the fact that people make antibodies or uh, they make certain types of immune cells that one can follow to say whether they may have developed immunity to uh, a, a, a pathogen. In this case, uh, because we don't know with COVID-19 uh, what that immune correlate really is, we're kind of stuck with asking people to give us traditional clinical disease endpoints, that is how many people actually get COVID-19. But hopefully after the first few vaccines come through, we'll be able to know what these uh, immune response looks like and then have an immune correlative protection uh, that people can study. That will greatly expedite uh, the study of further vaccines. And we also, um, uh, really, you've heard probably a lot of talk about this use of emergency use authorization. Um, this is something that was put in place after uh, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, mainly to deal with chemical, biologic, and radionuclear threats that might come about where we might not have uh, full data on medical products that could potentially benefit people. Now, for treating someone who has a disease, it's, it makes a lot of sense that you might take that, uh, it, it, take a little bit more risk here. For, for treating healthy people, we have to be a little more careful here. So we've kind of developed kind of a hybrid standard that we'll use for emergency use authorization for vaccines, which is that um, we, would, we would probably only issue an emergency use authorization if we really believed 
uh, that the vaccine was working from data from large uh, phase three trials that had been randomized. In other words, we need to see clear and compelling uh, effectiveness um, uh, rather than just something that might be effective, which is actually what the emergency use authorization standard is. So just to complete out this portion of the talk, um, you know, we've been trying to work with sponsors to move these products forward as quickly as we can. There are a lot of vaccines in development. As of yesterday, it was 192 or 194, depending on how you counted. Um, uh, that's globally, not just in the United States. And, and obviously we have dozens in development in the United States um, uh, with several in uh, more advanced clinical trials. Um, we are working to, uh, we, we are reviewing uh, these submissions very rapidly. We're working with global regulators because really this is one of those times when, you know, obviously it's, it's the, uh, it is a, a classic, uh, it's, it's like the classic thing. When, when we used to fly around, you used to hear it all the time, put your own mask on before assisting those around you. Yes, we need to get um, uh, our, 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 country vaccinated and get control of COVID-19 here. But ultimately, um, I think we will have to help the world get control of this virus or else it's just gonna become uh, something more like seasonal flu, which will just end up being a, a, a real mess. So uh, we are gonna work our best to, to do this. Um, and we're committed to developing, uh, helping developers uh, get a vaccine uh, out there that uh, is safe and effective without, uh, without compromising anything in, 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 in our standards. What I wanna do now is move away from COVID-19 into what COVID-19 interrupted, um, which was uh, the really a, a very robust uh, uh, development of gene therapies and cell-based gene therapies that was going on uh, in the year 2019, um, and actually which continues into 2020. Um, in, in the United States, we have uh, five approved gene therapies. Uh, three of these, uh, Tisagen Lucel, Axacabdogene, and Brexacabdogene, those are uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells for various hematologic malignancies. Uh, one of these is uh, Vareta gene is a, uh, an uh, adeno-associated viral vector gene therapy, which is a directly acting gene therapy, which is administered into the eye. And one of these, uh, Anasemnogene or Zolgensma, uh, is a systemic gene therapy. Uh, and I just want to tell you a little bit more about uh, Anasemnogene because it is a, a, a product that is kind of the, the first in class of what I think we'll see as potentially transformative gene therapies um, that really show you what the potential of these products are. Um, just to, 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 to just say, you know, in terms of activity in the gene therapy field, you might think that COVID-19 would have slowed things down um, and it probably has. Um, and even so, um, as of July, 2020, we have over a thousand active investigation new drug applications um, at, at FDA. Um, we had 134 investigation new drug applications submitted in calendar year uh, 2020 up through July, which if you look on the right upper panel here, you'll see that that means we're on target to meet or exceed the number of, uh, of uh, IND submissions that we had last year, which is pretty amazing to me given uh, the disruption that has happened with COVID-19. The lower panel here uh, is from the MIT New Digs group, and they talk about, you know, try to predict um, where we're going uh, with product launches, and they predict 40 to 60 product launches, those commercial product launches um, uh, by 2030. Um, and uh, whether there'll be more or less hard to know, uh, but um, I think it's, it's not, not unrealistic estimates. So where are we now? We have several approved gene therapies. There are many cell-based and directly administered gene therapies uh, in various stages of development. Um, however, what's really limiting things 
um, is the availability of high quality manufacturing uh, because that is actually just slowing down the capacity for throughput here. And so as we come through here, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what we're trying to do in, in terms of helping with that. Where we really need to go uh, is to try to get quality manufacturing to be considered from the outset um, uh, and to be prepared for positive clinical outcomes. Because one of the amazing things with some of these gene therapies is they are essentially the quintessential targeted therapy. Um, and it means that the, the likelihood, uh, the probability of success may be higher in some cases than average um, uh, than we're used to. And so uh, the idea of trying to de-risk manufacturing uh, may be a false economy here. In other words, having a manufacturing process from the outset that you can take through uh, to commercialization uh, could be beneficial. And so at, we're collaborating at FDA with a variety of stakeholders to try to develop more streamlined pathways uh, that can facilitate the manufacturing of advanced therapies such as gene therapies. So I'm just going to use um, uh, onosemnogene as, a, as a, an example here. Um, you know, this is a, a, a product for the treatment of, of uh, patients with spinal muscular atrophy, particularly type 1. Uh, type 1 spinal muscular atrophy uh, presents at birth um, it is uh, a terrible disease in which children are unable to uh, uh, really move the way they normally would. Uh, they develop muscle weakness that's so severe uh, that eventually by about the time they're two years old, they're on a ventilator. And usually then they succumb to complications uh, by the third year of life. So terrible disease. Um, uh, there was an oligonucleotide therapy for it, and there is an oligonucleotide therapy for it, which is, uh, has to be administered repeatedly, but this seemed like a very good target for gene therapy. Um, it is one of the more common of the rare diseases. Um, and uh, this was uh, studied. Um, the, uh, the graph on the left is really just meant to show you uh, that uh, the, the, and this is a case where you see 15 patients and 14 out of 15 uh, they start below the line or near the line and they uh, rise up. Um, uh, th this basically is uh, showing that, that that dotted line in the center is the, if you're below that, you have abnormal function. If you're above that, you have normal function as a simplified way of saying it. These, you don't need to be a statistician here to see that something good happened. And you really don't need to, when you can see a child like the one on the right, this is a child that was brought down to the Capitol Hill. Um, uh, and you know this child had the disease because they had the genetic abnormalities. You know that they should not be running around at this point if they did not have some intervention. And yet they are look like and are acting like a normal child. Very impressive. Now we don't know how long this gene therapy will, will last could last a very long time, could stop working at some point because we'll have to have longer term follow-up. But for the parents of a child um, like this, it is, it is very powerful. So what, what's going on here? There really is um, uh, the importance of therapies for disorders that are very rare are not just for those diseases that only affect a few dozen people per year, but they're also very important because as we move into the area of genome editing, many more common diseases may reduce themselves into a variety of small diseases that comprise a larger disease entity. And so if we can try to address this, these small entities, we may be better off in the, in the gene therapy field overall, and we may be able to actually uh, essentially export what we learn in the very small to the larger populations. So where, where is this really? What, what's really happened here is a transformation between personalized medicine, which was something of the 90s and early 2000s where it still was around, right? Personalized medicine is when you find the right drug on the shelf to treat the patient. What we're really talking about now is individualized medicine where you create the right drug to treat the patient. Um, and you know, this is something we have been used to in some ways um, because uh, there are customized products 
uh, which we've been used to seeing at FDA under IND for a while. Those are when you have products that have the same indication, the same mode of action, but there's something slightly different about each version that is produced for different patients. And an example of that could be a personalized cancer vaccine in which uh, there is something uh, done to the vaccine that makes it unique for the patient, such as it's, it's, it's pulsed with that individual's unique tumor. On the other hand, created products, um, one might leverage the same vector with different inserts to use a very similar product in some ways to treat a variety of different diseases. Um, uh, and, and that is something we're very interested in, in seeing if we can help develop that pathway. That's not something that we have been used to doing but if we can get there, may help move this field forward uh, more quickly. Uh, I, I put this up just to be lighthearted for a moment. Um, you know, personalized medicine is kind of like ready to wear. Um, uh, customized products are made to measure products where the, the fabrics is, is cut and seamed together. It just, the seams are not finished um, uh, so they can be easily moved around. And what we're talking about with these uh, created products or really bespoke therapies uh, where each one is created for either an individual or a small number of individuals. Um, the real challenge here um, is that uh, there are a variety of issues in manufacturing, non-clinical development, clinical development, and in product access. And I just will spend the last couple minutes here just uh, giving you an example of each of these. So for manufacturing, one of the real problems is that Right now in gene therapy, commercial viability, the sweet spot is unfortunately the grande size. It's kind of like Starbucks. They've taken the tall price and the, and the venti price off the menu at most places. And you just get to find out what the grande cost because that's what most people order. It turns out in gene therapy, that's where commercial viability is. Um, it's for uh, populations of about a hundred or more. Probably 10,000 is actually even too high right now. Um, but uh, hundreds to low thousands. And that's because that's what we can make efficiently and where the return on investment is reasonable. Um, the problem is once you get larger than that, we just simply, we don't have the technology to do it yet. So that's something that will come with time. When you get smaller, you lose commercial viability. And we have case studies of that because there was a gene therapy uh, on the market in Europe for lipoprotein lipase deficiency, which came off the market simply because not enough people were using it to make it commercially viable. Um, so we need to think about what we could do that could transform something that's not commercially viable into something that could be. Um, and we think that that could happen uh, by uh, starting to streamline our processes of development. How could we do that? Well, we think we can improve non-clinical development uh, by uh, using better models um, animal models might not always be the ideal model, um, uh, particularly when one is starting to think about genome editing, where if you're editing a human genome, uh, trying to do uh, gene editing uh, in a uh, mouse or in a monkey isn't really helpful when you're looking for off-target effects because their genomes are not human genomes unless they're a humanized mouse or humanized animal, in which case they can be highly informative. So we need to start thinking about using models that give us the most information. Organoids are basically when you can take a piece of a uh, tissue from a human and grow it in, in culture and actually get something that looks like uh, the organ uh, in miniature or functions like it. Um, for clinical development, one of the issues is we're really interested in how we uh, can most efficiently uh, get information to say that something is working. That means I think we need better methods of documenting national, natural history of disease and collecting baseline data. Trying to, trying to get efficacy data in small populations really can be challenging. And we're starting to think about ways of, of addressing this by using templates for collecting baseline data and essentially doing Bayesian clinical trial designs instead of going through traditional stage, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three. The idea here is you simply start treating patients and you have a pretest probability before the first one that something's gonna work or not that you just don't know, right? But if it works in that first patient, well then there's some higher likelihood that it's gonna work in the second patient and, and so on and so forth till after you've treated a certain number of patients, you, you actually feel confident in the product enough that you might be able to license it. Um, 
And one of the real problems here is how do you get to product access? Because unless you have commercial viability, right now producing these products is not, um, uh, is not cheap. Um, and unless we find a way there, academic institutions won't be able to continue doing it. Um, and so at least in the short term, until we can de-risk this and figure out ways that small companies or larger companies will want to pick up these therapies, we're thinking about public-private partnerships to help essentially develop a playbook. The idea is if you could make a playbook of how to go from a gene therapy target to a therapy for a patient, um, with streamlining the regulatory elements, reusing elements, in other words, reusing the manufacturing process for the vector, uh, reusing the chemistry manufacturing controls information, um, leveraging it so you take out a lot of the regulatory burden and a lot of the manufacturing burden, you might be able to reduce the cost enough to make it so that people might be interested in producing these. And so that's something we've been exploring. We're working with uh, the Foundation for NIH and in collaboration with the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences to uh, have a pilot program uh, with industry and academic partners to see if we can put a number of gene therapies through a pathway like this, make a playbook, and then see if that playbook is something that others can use so that these things can start to become commercially viable. So I'll just finish now by saying that we're very committed to advancing the development of cell and gene therapies for populations of all sizes. Um, and we do so by uh, really having individual uh, interactions with sponsors around product development or their individual products. We, we we're looking to use all of the levers, including helping with innovative clinical trial designs, novel endpoints, and one of the key things here is working to overcome limitations in manufacturing. And I think that's really probably the most important thing right now in the gene therapy field and probably the cell therapy field also. So I will stop there. <laughs>